total taxes, uh, but was clearly open, the pledge made it very clear, further reductions in, in the size, scope uh, of uh, the tax exemptions, deductions, credits, in return for re uh, reducing marginal tax rates so that it wasn't a tax increase. Um, that, I think, uh, keeps the door open to tax reform and would, uh, I would argue, the Taxpayer Protection Pledge makes tax reform to bring rates down possible in a world that it otherwise isn't. Without the commitment, since you don't have a Ronald Reagan at the White House making it clear this will not turn into a tax increase, you do have 228 uh, members of the House and 41 in the Senate who signed a document to their voters that they'll never allow a, a net tax increase to pass with their support, which is enough to stop it, as Obama has found out. Uh, so the pledge helps make it possible to have tax reform in part two, uh, and the economics that were just discussed. I mean, American companies are worth more if they move overseas, because we have a worldwide tax, and then the other part is not only we have tax rates that are too high, but we have a worldwide tax system. Uh, our worldwide tax system, where you earn money in France, the French government snitches some of it, and then if you're foolish enough to bring it back to the United States, we snitch some of it. Uh, but if you leave it in France to build factories, we don't snitch more of it. Uh, which puts an odd incentive into the uh, system. The rest of the world says you earn money in you earn money in France. France will tax it. Your French person, you earn money in the United States. France doesn't come and take a bite of, uh, at the apple. In a international uh, business world, in a world uh, uh, where we're trying to have global uh, scale and, and global companies, uh, American companies are today because of worldwide claims of worldwide uh, power to tax and the overly high tax rates. This wouldn't matter if we had 10% tax rate. It wouldn't have those uh, sorts of effects. But we need to, one, get the rates down and and uh, go back, go to a territorial um, tax system rather than a worldwide uh, tax system. Uh, a couple of challenges. Uh, when we're here in Tampa at the Republican Convention, and we're trying to figure out how do we have Republican Party committed every single Republicans say four guys voted for the Ryan plan, and while everyone, everyone, while Obama tends to focus on the Medicare reform part of that, the Ryan plan, the Ryan budget, the Ryan roadmap has it says let's set up a tax code that is uh, uh, not worldwide but territorial, just taxes activity in the United States, and two has a top corporate individual rate of twenty five percent. After that, he lets Dave Camp write the rest of it. Um, I would argue that if he tried to micromanage everything, the guys are wasting means would go, hey, hey, that's our job. But everybody has agreed 25% is a good top rate to start with. It's not a bottom rate, it's a top rate. Uh, and uh, territoriality is, is an important uh, concept. We've had the same uh, support level among Republicans in the Senate. Uh, so we have a Republican consensus on going at least to 25 and 25 uh, with territoriality. The challenge we have, and what we need to work on, is the 1960, we're talking about the Democrats in the Senate now. 1964, we had marginal tax rate cuts. Six, 56 Democrat senators voted for it. 1981, we had marginal tax rate across the board cuts. Uh, Reagan's structured very similar to Kennedy's, but only 23 Democratic senators voted for it. When we did revenue neutral tax reform in 86, we got 33 Democratic senators, so a blip up. 2001, zero senators voted to cut the top rate from 40 to 35, uh, and one Democrat senator um, voted to cut the capital gains tax from 20 to 15 and the dividend tax. So while we've seen unanimity on the Republicans for going to a top rate of 25, the Democrat Senate interest on marginal tax rates has gone from 56 down to zero or one, and that's a, a challenge in, in getting this across the finish line. We did see in revenue neutral tax reform as many as 33 Ds in 86, uh, and so that may make uh, life easier uh, for the Democrats to, uh, to participate. Um, but so I, but this is key. Uh, if you want to raise revenue, if you grow at uh, 3% a year over the next decade instead of 2% a year, the federal government gets an extra $2.5 trillion in higher revenue just from growth, because more people are working, more people are earning more money, uh, more income is there to be uh, taxed, 
the federal government uh, acts like the house in Las Vegas. It just sort of creams off a certain percentage of the economic activity. And the more people that go to your casino, the more money the house has, the more economic activity uh, that happens, the more money the government gets. Uh, and uh, you do see, at least in Las Vegas, they all advertise how small a take, right? When you see the little ads, you drive down, they say, we only take one and a half percent of everything that you're going to gamble in our show, so come with us. And our federal government invites businesses to invest here by saying we take 35. Uh, and guys down the street, or guys up to the north are at 17? 15 in January. The Canadians, the ones to the north, 15 percent. Um, corporate income tax. Successful people and companies tend to think that that's the way the world works and the reason why they're successful is that they're just wonderful people or wonderful countries. Uh, and they forget that sound policy made the United States a wealthy uh, and, uh, nation, not being swell. Uh, and that if we stop take following those policies or find ourselves surrounded uh, with other countries that learn from our success, okay? We're always talking about wanting to teach everybody to be a democracy or something, but people have looked over and said, there are a whole series of things you're doing interestingly, and they really like the lower marginal tax rates and they're early adopters of that, and we've forgotten uh, that that was one of the things that drove American growth and job creation, and we can't just act like the American economy is an ATM for government uh, and not recognize that the reason that the economy did well in the first place is we had historically and com comparably low marginal tax rate. There's a wonderful book on, that Alvin Rabushka wrote on the history of taxation in colonial America. Um, and when you go through it, uh, he goes through that the, in 1714 and 1740s, uh, the average American paid colonialist living in now the United States, paid 1 to 2% of their income in total tax burden, 1 to 2%. The Brits at the same time had a really cool empire and big ships and big armies. They paid 20%. And so for the next 100 years or so, we grew a lot faster than Britain did. Um, and we get to win more gold medals at the Olympics at their house. Uh, so if you, if you follow a policy of low marginal tax rates, and then stop following it, and the rest of the world gets smart and starts doing what you did right, you can't just assume that we continue to be the leader in economic growth that we have been in the past. So we need to learn from our successes, going back to, I think one or two percent was probably outrageously high at the time, but we, we could start by getting it down to that uh, level. Uh, and learn from the fact that with low marginal tax rates, we had strong economic growth. Other countries have figured that out. Uh, and we don't operate uh, all by our lonesome in a vacuum. We're, we compete with the rest of the world to provide the best place to create jobs and invest resources uh, and bring people. Right. Um, thanks, thank you, Gordon. Just listening to what you